Well, for more on global health, vaccines, and the so-called anti-vaxxers, I'm joined by Daniel Solomon, live from Baltimore. He's an associate professor at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health and also the deputy director of the university's Institute of Vaccine Safety. Thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you for having me. So what should we take away from the World Health Organization's report's correlation between incomes and vaccines? Well, what we see in low-income countries is that drops in, in low coverage is largely about access. Um, most people want vaccines, but don't always have ready access to them. And that's different than what we see in developed countries, such as the U.S. and Europe, where access has really been addressed. People have access to vaccines. And what we see is that some people have concerns about the safety and the need for vaccines and are actually re refusing them. And that's why we see the World Health Organization calling vaccine hesitancy a top 10 global health threat. And that's why we're seeing a lot of measles outbreaks in Europe and children are dying. And we're seeing more and more measles in the US as well. Now, France is actually home to the highest rates of non-vaccinated children in the developed world, and there's growing skepticism in other parts of the developed world. Why is that, and what are some of the implications? Well, it's a complicated issue. Um, one of the big factors is that vaccines are really victims of their, of their own success. Because we have maintained high levels of vaccine coverage, we really don't see these diseases much. So people aren't aware of them, they don't see them, they don't fear them, and instead we see fear shifting to the vaccines themselves. And so why are these programs then seen more favorably in lower income countries? Why is there not the same level of skepticism? Well, in those developing countries, they still have a lot of disease. So they're reminded of how deadly measles can be, for example, because they see measles and they see children dying of measles. In the US and many developed countries, we've really greatly reduced the, the incidence of disease. Not many children get measles. It's very, very rare to see the, the cases of disease and the death that can come from it. Now, let's also look at the anti-vaccination movement. We know that there are plenty of online forums of concerned parents, but you also have these extremely wealthy donors giving millions to push back against vaccines. What's driving the growth of this school of thought and this really high spending by some of these high wealth um, individuals? Well, you know, I, I can't speak to the donations of individuals, but I can say this. Very few people are truly anti-vaccine. It's less than one or two percent of the population that are ideologically opposed to vaccines. Now, they may have a large internet presence and make a lot of noise, but they don't reflect the vast majority of people. The, the norm is to vaccinate, but we see 25, 30% of parents have concerns about vaccines. They have concerns about the safety. So these aren't people that are anti-vaccines. They're not ideologically opposed to vaccines, but they have concerns, and those concerns need to be addressed. And what about efforts to limit vaccine opt-outs? We're seeing, obviously, some schools not really sure what they should do if a parent is like, I don't want to vaccinate my child, but you also don't want to get the other children sick. Where do things stand with that? Well, are you asking about the laws themselves or the decisions of parents? The, with, the, with the, law, the, laws, the laws themselves the laws. that are governing whether you can opt out of vaccinations. So, you know, this is very different around the world. In the U.S., we've had laws requiring vaccines going back a long time. Um, since the 1970s and 1980s, they've been fairly uniform, uniformly enforced. They're all state laws. There are no federal laws. Um, all states allow exemptions for medical purposes. Some children can't be vaccinated. And then 46 states offer non-medical exemptions. Um, until a couple weeks ago, it was 47 states. New York eliminated their religious exemptions. And in 2015, California eliminated non-medical exemptions. So we are seeing a trend in states getting rid of non-medical exemptions. Now, this is a controversial uh, subject because obviously fear about your child's well-being, it's a very visceral, very personal response. So how do doctors go about balancing the science with the concerned parents and some of these anti-vaxxers, especially when there's so much misinformation out there about vaccines? Well, doctors have a really important role. Um, doctors are considered the most credible source for vaccine information, even among parents that are hesitant about vaccines. 
So they have a really important job to talk with people, to hear their concerns, and to help the parents make the decision that is in the best interest of the children. For vaccines that are routinely recommended, the benefits of vaccines greatly outweigh the risks. So when a parent comes into a doctor's office and asks questions, the doctor needs to listen to the parents, address their concerns, address them with evidence and science, and, and explain to the, the parent why it's in their child's best interest to get vaccinated. But you know, the, choosing to vaccinate your child, it's not just an individual choice. The choice that you make impacts other children. And this is really a unique and special thing about vaccines. Um, if I vaccinate my child and enough children are vaccinated, right. that protects the, the rest of the community. And if I don't vaccinate my child, that puts other children at risk. Certainly have to keep that in mind. Thank you so much. Daniel Salman, the Associate Professor at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health and Deputy Director of the University's Institute of Vaccine Safety.